Okay, looks like we've we've got a good attendance. Um, hello and welcome. This is the Data Access and Discovery webinar. Um, today we'll be talking about the data journeys from two of our um, health data research hubs. Um, so today uh, we will actually be recording this webinar today and, and we will make this available along with all of the other resources after the session. But we'd like to ask that you please use the Q&A throughout the session to post questions to our speaker panels and we'll get through as many as we possibly can at the end. So just to give you a rough idea, this is how the, um, the, the seminar is made up today. Um, I will, I'm opening, we'll, we'll then go to David Seymour for a brief history on the hubs. And then we'll turn for a patient perspective um, on the Alleviate um, Hub. And then we'll turn um, to talk more about the data journey um, for the Alleviate Hub. And then we'll turn over to Data Miner and John will talk us through their journey on, on, on how um, and, and on their data hub as well. And then this will be closely followed for 15 minutes by a QA speaker session. So thank you very much. Um, I'm now going to pass over to David, with great delight. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so yes, David Seymour. Uh, I'm Director of Instruction Services at Health Data Research UK, for those who don't know me. Uh, and I'm very fortunate to have the role of providing an introduction and brief history of the Health Data Research Hubs in about five minutes. Uh, so that's actually about just, just over 1,700 days uh, since the Digital Innovation Hub uh, sort of prospectus was launched and I guess that kicked off the process of establishing the health data research hub so over 1700 days in five minutes let's see how we how we do um I want to start initially I, I, many people will be familiar with health data research UK our mission and vision uh, but I thought it was always, always worth uh, just recapping for the benefit of anybody new uh, and also I guess just make sure we've got that focus um, on what we are trying to achieve, which is very much about uniting the UK's health data to enable discoveries that improve people's lives. And through that, over that 20 year vision um, for large scale data and analytics to benefit every patient interaction, clinical trial, biomedical discovery and enhance public health. Uh, and we're very grateful to our core funders uh, listed at the bottom there uh, for their investment in this endeavor um, over the period 23 to 28, which is the second uh, five years of Health Data Research UK's existence. Um, just in terms of that overall sort of scale of the ambition, uh, we're obviously sort of focused on the UK, but we're very much a sort of an international uh, sort of uh, view of the world. But that does mean then for our UK wide studies, we're trying to achieve um, you know, study, study populations across 67 million people and obviously growing. We want to get that diversity and detail from different data modalities. And we want to make sure we've got that full uh, lifespan uh, across the piece. And therefore, obviously, things such as primary care data a very uh, essential aspects to the overall sort of mission and vision. And just an example there on the right hand side that again, hopefully people are familiar with uh, the CoLS study uh, looking at vaccine uptake uh, and the consequences of missing vaccines um, across the UK population. Um, you know, notable as much for the fact that it's that first four nation study um, as obviously for those insight gained uh, and helps how it helped shape policy during the pandemic. So what are we actually trying to achieve here and where do the hubs fit in? Well, it's very much about moving from a one-to-one -one data custodian researcher relationship to a situation where we've got many different custodians of data serving many different research innovators. And I'd say that the health data research hubs as part of a sort of network, including secure data environments or trusted research environments are absolutely essential for making those connections across the different data custodians, different data collectors, and making that available to different researchers and innovators with a range of use cases and doing that in a trustworthy way and a consistent way across different sets of policies covering information governance, technology standards, and obviously data models. And all of that to really accelerate trustworthy health data research. So where did it all begun? begin? Uh, it was the Digital Innovation Hub Programme, as I mentioned, which was a part of the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund, Data to Early Diagnosis Precision Medicine Challenge, um, and you will see there were three components to that, really. The Health Data Research Alliance, which is now over 100 members, uh, looking at really establishing those best practice standards. The Health Data Research Innovation Gateway for discovery and access. And then the Health Data Research Hubs there in the middle, really focusing on the curation and the data services uh, to deliver for users so that we're able to return 
patient and public benefit. So you can read more about the Digital Innovation Hub programme and its evaluation, uh, which was published in August of last year, uh, and just a couple of sort of the news items there on the screen, but hopefully we'll be able to, to share the links for you. And I think it's really important that not only the achievements of those hubs are no noted, but also the lessons that we've learned through establishing those health data research hubs. And that's really helping now to shape and deliver the NHS data for R&D programme, including both the NHS Research Secure Data Environment, or SDE network, which you'll see there is configured of the NHS England secure data environment, plus then these subnational secure data environments, and also the NHS Digi trials, which again has been instrumental in recruit, recruiting to studies and trials such as um, our future health uh, and the growth in that. And you'll see there with some of the logos and how they're mapping into those different aspects um, of the new ecosystem. Uh, and I particularly just call out sort of Discover Now, which is helping to, to shape and deliver the London secure data environment. And again, pioneers close links into the West Midlands secure data environment, plus then DataCan and the British Heart Foundation working with NHS England on that central piece. And again, that network have decided to use uh, the Health Data Research Gateway as their single front door. So where are we today? Well, in essence, we've got a set of condition specific hubs, platforms and data science centres. Some of these have, have come through the Digital Innovation Hub programme. Some of them, the two that you'll hear about today, Alleviate and Mind have come through from MRC, uh, Medical Research Council funding calls, and really establishing in new and different disease areas and uh, supporting their, their communities. But then you've also got um, uh, platforms such as Dementia's Platform UK, and also the work led out of the British Heart Foundation Data Science Centre, which again, are looking at those sort of condition specific um, and domain specific areas of expertise to really build out fair data services that's findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And then the latest edition uh, is formo focused on traumatic brain inju injury. So TBI Reporter uh, is there as a repository and data portal enabling that discovery. And again, that's jointly funded by the Medical Research Council and IHR uh, and Ministry of Defence and Alzheimer's Research UK. And then really just to close, I think it's really important uh, to focus on why does this all still really matter? Why does data to early diagnosis precision matter? Medicine still matter. It's because patients want their data to be used to improve care, and they're often surprised that it's not already used, to quote Jackie, cancer survivor and patient advocate. Thank you very much, David. And now I'd like to hand over to Anthony Shooter, who is our PPI lead for Alleviate and a trustee of Pain UK. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. Can you see me now? Just. Yep. Oh, that's great. OK, good afternoon, everyone. My name's Anthony Tudor. I am a patient. I've lived with chronic pain for over 30 years. Um, I've got a number of other health conditions and I am, for my sins, the uh, PPI lead for Olivia. I say for my sins, I actually love working with Olivia. I love working with the team. And in fact, I see in the audience today, there are actually a few people from other teams that I've worked on in the past and people I still work with. So hello, everybody that knows me. And, um, and sorry if you've heard some of this before. Um, what is my role at, at Alleviate? Well, I, I say my role is really to support um, patients and members of the public get involved. So I help stimulate the work of the PPI group. Um, I help support people. I help empower people. Uh, I never use the word training. Um, to me, it's all about giving people the confidence to speak and be themselves and also creating a community at Alleviate of people that um can want to share how they feel about things so a bit about me yeah a bit about me so i live in sussex um i stopped working years ago because of living with chronic pain i was in my 20s at the time it was quite devastating and i as many people who live with pain um get i became clinically depressed not not uncommon I spent about 10 years in that space of being depressed, agoraphobic, um, not really looking after myself at all. And I got involved in the expert patient program. I first of all went along as a punter and did the six week course. And the expert patient program, for those of you who don't know it, was a six week self-management program that was led by 
patients living with conditions and they role modeled um, being a good self manager. And um, in technical terms, it created activated patients in healthcare. So people that wanted to look after themselves and then did look after themselves and their conditions better. And I was so bowled over by the effect of the expert patient program on me that I became a volunteer tutor. And that then opened the world. Um, first of all, it opened the world to me to members of the public, all sorts of members of the public who turned up on those courses. And I got to see the, the sort of the breadth of society. Now, I, I had been a volunteer for Samaritans for a number of years, so I kind of seen the diversity of society a bit from people who came to Samaritans. But Expert Patient Programme was different because a lot of the people were people like me, people struggling with a health condition, people looking for an answer people struggling with the system and test after test. And one of the things we say about people living with pain, and I'm actually sure this is the same for people living with mental health conditions, is people often don't feel listened to and they don't feel believed and they don't feel understood and they don't feel cared for. And they feel very alone. And that's the same for pain. And I believe it's the same for mental health problems. So this kind of goes between alleviate and data mind. And um, Expert Patient Programme opened up the world for me because I got involved in public involvement in the health service locally, and that then led me to joining the patient group at the Royal College of GPs and eventually becoming the chair there, and then moving on to the British Pain Society and chairing that group, and really rebuilding that group. So I sort of grew my expertise in public involvement from the ground up. Now... I think patient involvement in research and particularly in health data research is really important because you've got to connect with the people at the bottom, the people who really need this help. Um, this data is about them. Some might say it's their data. Some might say it's the Secretary of State's health data. I'm not going to get into that whole debate about who owns the data and what can be done with it. But there's tons of data out there. And if you look at pain, especially, that's the area I'm really interested in. But I am interested in mental health as well, because there's a huge crossover between the two conditions. Um, but if you look at pain, there's been no real advances in medicine or treatment in the last 30 years. There's been no blockbuster drugs. There's been no development of better treatments. And all the treatments have side effects. And some of those side effects are really severe. So opioids and opioid-induced constipation, nobody talks about it, but basically you get bunged up. You can't go to loo for five, six days. You get seriously constipated. And then what people do is they stop treatment to be able to go to the loo. And the pain of the constipation is then worse than their actual pain, so they trade off. There's no way to live. And there are 28 million people in the UK living with some sort of pain. Of that 28 million, 8 million people live with moderate to severe pain that severely impacts their life. And you've got 20 million people, probably lots of you are one of those 20 million, 20 million people, one in three people who live with some sort of pain in their life, mild to moderate pain. They might have regular migraines, you might have backache, you might have problems with your feet or problems with your knees or pain in your hips. You might have endometriosis, you might have sickle cell disease. You might have any number of conditions that affect you pain-wise. So patient involvement in research is really important. And I think the work of Alleviate and Data Mind, my hope is that, you know, I don't just do this for fun. I do this because I think and I hope and I pray that this will help millions of people in the future. If you think about the people that developed antibiotics, how many millions of lives have they saved? How many millions of, um, how have they changed the quality of people's lives, not just the lives saved? And if you develop a new treatment for pain, you affect people's quality of life and you probably extend their life years because we know that living with pain actually shortens people's lives. Um, yeah, my recent blog's there. I don't know how I'm doing on time. Alison, how am I doing on time? Just just a minute over. You're oh, my God. Over. Okay, well, I will stop there. <laughs> Thank you, though, Apologies Anthony. Apologies for going over. Not a problem. Thank you so much for sharing your experience. Is there any 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 further comment? Any, any other comment you'd like to say before um, we move on? 
I, I just think, you know, public involvement is really important because you've got to, uh, you've got to, you've got to turn the pyramid upside down and have the patients at the top and then the researchers. And they're, they're, I, people ask me what I do. And I say, I grab professors and researchers and clinicians by their ankles and pull them back down to the ground. Uh, because um, without my experiences and without the experiences of the people I work with, the research is kind of meaningless. You've got to have us involved. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anthony. Great to hear from you as always. Um, I, I'd like to, with that, I'd like to move on now to the spotlight on Alleviate and Gordon Milligan, who is our deputy director of Alleviate, and 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 Chris Cole, who is the, is the director of Alleviate and senior. Um, lecturer at the Health Informatics Centre of the University of Dundee. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. It's great to see so many uh, people actually here. Um, so, and thanks, uh, Anthony, for talking about the PPI um, from the Alleviate. Um, you know, PPI and Alleviate is, is essentially, it's not a tick box exercise. Uh, the, the PPI team are throughout our entire project and Anthony like chairs a lot of our meetings just to keep everything flowing so that we are always getting the, the viewpoints of those who I love with pain and their experiences. And so I'm going to cover a few slides to cover the background of Alleviate and then I'll hand over to Chris Cole who will go into the, the more in-depth uh, data side of things. Um, so I know you covered a lot about this, but chronic pain is defined as pain lasting for three months uh, or longer. As Anthony said, there's about 28 million adults in the UK are currently living with chronic pain as per a study that was done in 2016 by the British Pain Society. Um, one thing that's well known is that uh, chronic pain is, uh, is poorly captured in health data. Um, it's hard to pin down and define exactly what it is. Um, but there is actually moves afoot to try and improve this. And actually, um, Professor Leslie Colvin, who's a PI on our project, um, is running a, a, a project called Sea Pictures that's kind of trying to address that and uh, alleviate her some, some involvement in that project. Um, chronic pain was first recognized as a condition under ICD-11 uh, by the World uh, Health, Health Organization, which is you know a big step forward. And hopefully that will lead to better uh, you know, evaluations of patients and better treatment decisions because um, the data can be found. Um, like we touched on, feedback and opinions of people who live with pain is invaluable for pain research. And it's touched on it, we believe in it, it's through every single thing we do, and I think that'll come through in the, the, the slides coming up. So Alleviate is part of the Advanced Pain Discovery Platform. Um, so about four years ago, three, four years ago, um, a big pot of funding was put together of about 34 million um, through a number of different funders um, to try and target the chronic pain and to try and target finding chronic pain treatments and improve treatments like Anthony says, no, there's not been any major advances. So a big pot of money was put together to try and make some progress and alleviates part of that. Um, part of this platform, um, it's national scale, there's teams from uh, all different countries, there's um, a platform that we're trying to attend, there's a community, and there's various projects covering different aspects of chronic pain, so they're trying to attack it from uh, lots of different ways. Just trying to collect together lots of pain clinicians, pain researchers, uh, those who work in health informatics with an interest in chronic pain and trying to make some, uh, some progress. And the APDP do have a website which you can, you can go to as well. Um, as part of the APDP, there are four main consortia. So there is a pain storm, um, so they're looking at uh, neuropathic pain. There's Advantage, which is looking at visceral pain. There's CAPE, um, which looks at adverse childhood experiences. And there's CRISP, which is looking at interpersonal and social influences in pain. All these different consortia are running their own clinical trials, um, which are running for, uh, I think, four years. Um, I think it's gone up to five years now. So uh, Alleviate, we work with them from the early days um, when they're looking to collect the data to try and advise them on the best ways of collecting the data and how to structure the data so that when they collect it, 
we can get it in a format that makes it easier to use, to analyze, and for other people to actually potentially reuse the data. That's what we're trying to do. So Alleviate Hub sits in the middle of these consortia and kind of works with them, advises them, and as uh, Chris will talk about later, you know, helps standardize their data so that we get more value from the data that they are actually collecting. Um, uh, David briefly touched on it earlier, um, fair principles. So fair prin data principles are something that runs right through um, Alleviate, and it's definitely something that are our guiding principles. Um, so we're looking for the data sets that come to Alleviate to be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So a big, really, a lot of our time is spent on the, the findable part. Uh, because of the stage we're in in the project. So we are kind of going around trying to find as many data sets as possible related to chronic pain and encourage people who have these data sets, the data owners, to come to us and speak to us and see what benefit that Alleviate Hub can actually give them. So if you have any, um, you know, if you're a, a pain uh, collection and data owner or know anyone who is, um, Feel free to get them to get in touch with us. We've got on a website and um, contact us form, and we'd be happy to speak to them. Um, so we do the findable part through you know social media, webinars about the data, these sorts of things. But we also work with HDR using their uh, gateway and their metadata catalog and the core discovery tool to make the data findable in that way. And we also try to make that data accessible. Again, we use the HDR gateway uh, mainly for that because they've got uh, good procedures in place for request access to the data. And we also try and make it interoperable and reusable. So we have a lot of uh, expert engineers, which Chris will talk about, um, and we try to organize the data and standardize it, the data in a format that makes it um, easier to reuse, compare, link up, and analyze. Um, and my final slide before Robert Chris is really an overview of what I've been talking about. There's lots of different data sets around uh, for chronic pain, but a lot of people don't really know about them unless they've kind of read a paper or been to a conference where somebody's been talking about it. So Alivia is trying to address that issue. We are trying to go out into the world and find these data sets and bring them towards Alleviate so that people can just come to Alleviate um, or the HDR gateway to find these data sets. That's, that's, our, that's our aim. That's what we're trying to do. Um, and in doing that, we're trying to bring those data sets into like a standardized format so they're easier to actually use and so that the data sets are well documented so that people will just pick them up and go and use them for their own research. Um, and the idea is that that then makes those data sets more discoverable. Um, and doing that, we're kind of using the uh, current uh, OMOP, OMOP mapping tools, um, which were developed originally during uh, CoConnect, and that was developed by sort of universities in Dundee, Nottingham, and Edinburgh. And we've continued developing them under the banner of um, alleviate with uh, Dundee and Nottingham as well. Um, I'm going to pass over to uh, Chris now. Thanks very much, Gordon. Um, apologies if you hear any uh, background noise. Unfortunately, I'm not in the office today. I'm, I'm out and about. So, um, so yes, alleviate has been working with, with existing data sets and, and data owners uh, to bring their data together under a common platform. And the, the shop window to this is, is the metadata catalog available through HDR UK. And you can see that we cover for data sets from across, across the UK. Um, uh, next slide, please. And, um, so at the moment, there are 20 pain data sets within the catalog and they're uh, available under the Alleviate collection, which uh, you'll be able to find um, uh, quite easily within uh, from the innovation gateway. And currently, um, there are three pain specific data sets within the cohort discovery tool, which is um, an online tool for live querying of the data in a in a secure and, and safe and anonymous way. So you can query the metadata of, of these data sets. We've got quite a few other data sets on in the pipeline, um, which are, are on their way. Uh, next slide. And just to give you a bit of a flavor, what, what that gives you, um, I'll go through three, three, those, what, three of those data sets um, that we, we've worked on. And to show you that, you know, by doing this mapping and you can do this querying live. So this is an example 
this isn't a live view that, that data, this is an example of what you can see. Um, you can get a ratio of the, of the sexes, you can get a distribution of the ages of the cohorts, and then you can have a look at see what specific concepts around OMOP, which I'll explain in a second, um, are available within that data set. So for example, here, Joan Ocean Scotland, which is a, a biobank um, in, in Scotland, um, has 108 pain phenotypes or co concepts as they're called um, available within it. Um, whereas, oh, next slide, please. Whereas uh, the next one is a more specific, it's a smaller data set uh, looking at carpal tunnel syndrome. Um, but again, you can see there's a different age distribution um, and different pain concepts are in there and in a different proportion. And there are fewer, not surprising, because it's a smaller data set. Uh, next slide, please. And lastly, here's a, another one, just as an example. Again, fewer pain concepts, different pain concepts as well. And now you can see that's a different uh, age and uh, sex distribution going on here as well. So you can use this tool on your own to identify which data sets are of most interest or most used to your, to your research. And uh, we have done this through uh, developing and working with specific tools. So next slide. And this has been done through data harmonization and standardizing the data through this um, OMOP model, as it's called, the Observational Medical Outcomes Partnership, which is a, an international open, um, open standard that's been used for, for a long time now. Um, and we have developed specific tools to aid and make this mapping much easier than it, than it was previously. And you can look at that website to find out more access to these open source tools that you can use yourself if you wish, or you can contact us to help you map your own data. Um, it doesn't have to be pain data, it can be any any types of data sets that you want. Uh, next slide. And so, as we were saying, there are three data sets at the bottom there, which are uh, currently available. Um, and then there's, there's um, what is that, uh, 11, 12 different other data sets that are in progress um, at some at different stages. And so we will be, you know, you will be seeing more of these data sets going in there and they will be able to be queried in exactly the same way as all the others. Um, and the advantage is, is that they will all be mapped to the same standard. And so you can, you can do these uh, analyses across all the data sets uh, at the same time. Uh, next slide. And so we believe the strengths of Alleviate is uh, uh, around uh, the data services, obviously, we're a data hub, so that's, that's the point, and trying to um, enrich these data sets and bring them out of their silos and, and make them more discoverable and usable using the fair standards that Jordan talked about. Obviously, um, uh, Anthony talked very clearly and very eloquently about his public and his, his, his involvement in, the, in Alleviate, and he has brought us down to the ground, as he says, and he's been a, a, an amazing asset and has all the, 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 the wider PPI team as well. And the next stage of Olivia is all about data sharing and bringing the data together. So, um, and that's what we'll I'll talk about in, in a second now. So, right, next slide, please. And so um, we, uh, we have gained a lot of experience of this, this mapping through Olivia and CoConnect and over the years, we've mapped uh, over 10 million health records. Um, basically, every data set within the HDR cohort discovery tool um, has, we have been involved in, in the, those mappings of those data sets. Uh, next slide. And so this is what part of the OMOP data model looks like. It's, it's lots of lines, lots of boxes, and lots of interconnectedness, which basically means that every uh, person or in every aspect of that person's health or patient journey can, can be captured in a standard form and then can be queried. And then you can do that across multiple data sets. Uh, and that's slow. And so then we have simplified this through these, these pilot tools in such a way that actually we can do the mapping of your data without actually ever seeing your data. You share us uh, an extract of the metadata, a descriptor of the metadata of, the, of your data, and then we can do the mapping for you uh, blind, and then you can make that data map to 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 the OMOP uh, in your own environment, and then you can choose whether you want to share it by the cohort discovery tool or not. Um, but so you know that's that's a really important difference that uh, I think um, other other uh, providers won't be able to do.
Uh, next slide. And so, like I say, we 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 will do this now as a service. We've done this for for a few people now, and uh, we can map health data. We can review the mappings. We can provide guidance. We can help. We can give consultancy at any level, basically, or include us as as a research collaboration to to do to enrich your data sets. With uh, next slide. And finally, the, the last bit is that when you have found your data set that you like and you want to use, you can contact the, the data owners. We're not the data owners, but the, the, the people who are the research and collect the data is, um, is you know, they're the data controllers. And once you've um, made an agreement to collaborate with them, then through the OMOP, through the standardized method, you can stick it into a, a trusted research environment like is available within Alleviate. And so, the aggregation and the extraction is much more straightforward. Um, and then you can get onto doing your, your low level analysis much more quickly. Um, next slide. And uh, that's us basically. So if this is the collaborators that we have within the Alleviate project um, across the UK and please contact us however you wish. Um, and we have lots of um, uh, outputs from our pain group uh, on on YouTube and Elite and on on Twitter. So please engage with that and um, see what the patient journey has been with with our team. And thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Gordon and Chris, for that introduction and, and explanations of all the incredible work you've been doing. Um, so I'd like to move on now to um, Anne John, and Anne John is the co-director of DataMind and also a professor of public health and psychiatry at Swansea University. Welcome and thank you, Anne. Thanks, Alison. It's great. It's great to see so many people here. I'm just going to share my slides. I'm really going to give a whistle-stop tour of um, DataMind and some of the, and basically what we're trying to achieve. We're funded, we were funded through the same round as Alleviate by the MRC. And I guess, you know, the names on the tin, we focus on mental health data. And I think in terms of, of mental health, when we think about traditional studies, a lot of people with poor mental health may be least likely to take part in those studies because they require, a, you know, often a lot of effort to participate. And if they do take part, then often when you want to see what happens, you know, in a, a year or five years time, they may not want to put, they may not want to take part then. So lots of people are lost to, to follow up. And those sorts of issues that we find when we're trying to understand why mental health problems develop, how they express themselves through people's lives, and then really look for you know, management and treatment options. Some of those problems are partly overcome when we, we think about routinely collected data, that data that is there as we go about our day-to-day -day lives. And the great thing about that sort of data is because it's real world data, it really speaks to policymakers and the public and practitioners. So those sorts of studies, you know, trials and cohorts where people participate, they're important. But for many mental health conditions, like say schizophrenia, the numbers in general population cohorts can be quite small. So some of these issues are the issues that we're trying to address in terms of um, data mind. And, and I guess the other one is when you, when you think about when the things you ask when you're um, in contact with services in a mental health history are inherently different to those in a, in a physical health um, history. You know, you're really asking about people's personal lives, their employment, where they live. And some of those issues have meant that for some people, that data has been considered inherently a bit more sensitive. It also relates to the stigma associated with mental health problems. Yeah. However, in work that we've done, led by Rudolf Cardinal, what you see is where research based on data is available for public benefit. You know, people are very happy for it to be used by the NHS and by academics 
but there were some tensions about sharing that information with industry. But it's those partnerships between, you know, practitioners, academics and industry where we might see innovations in how we manage mental health problems because very similar to what Anthony said, there have been very few new treatments developed in this field. So one of the things we really wanted to do in DataMind was address some of the misconceptions and limits around that trusted relationship. So, so within DataMind, we have particular things we're focused on. They're very similar to Alleviate, you know, public participation, PPI, involving people with lived experience in data mind has been pivotal. I'm gonna talk a bit about that. Fair curated data we'd heard about. We thought about um, sustainability of the hub. You know, this is something, you know, that you want to extend well beyond um, initial grant funding, but then also workforce and capacity development. You know, there's a real shortage of mental health data scientists and part of, of making data work for people is making sure that we've got the capacity to make the most of it. We also had uh, what we called road builders that covered a number of innovations, including things like natural language processing, um, digitally enhanced trials, um, looking at the interface between physical and mental health that we focused on. And DataMind is a partnership um, across a number of universities across the country. We absolutely took a four nation approach, which isn't surprising because I'm based in Wales. And um, a lot of those networks built on previous MRC investments in what they called mental health data pathfinders. So this is the team um, there's a lot of us and we really are based across all sorts of different disciplines, you know, from people, I'm very focused on social determinants of mental health and primary care data. Rob, my co-director, Rob Stewart, is very focused on severe mental illness. Um, Andrew on genetics. So it's a truly multidisciplinary lens on this issue. So I'm going to I've picked out a few things uh, to talk to you about. So our super research advisory group is phenomenal. That has been recognized by HDR UK. And we're up for, a, for an award uh, from HDR UK. One of the big things that we've done is we hold industry forum. And by that, we're not just talking about pharma industry, we're also talking about the well-being industry, anyone who uses data and people delivering services. And we brought people from industry in our SRAG, our super research advisory group, uh, which is people with lived experience together to develop guidelines for the limp, for sort of the potentials and the limitations around that working. But one of the first things we realized was when you bring, we see it in research across different disciplines, but when you bring people with such different backgrounds together, you know, data scientists, people from industry, people delivering services, people with lived experience, you may all think you're talking the same language, but you're really not. And uh, there were really, there were words like even the word profit that we realized you know, we, none of us were talking about the same thing. So if you're developing guidelines, that common language is really important. So one of the things we did is we worked with uh, the McPin Foundation, MQ, and um, our super research advisory group to develop a data literacy short course. And that really explains, it, it runs for an hour, it's available on our website and the HDR UK website to, to enable people to understand what sometimes is really, really technical language. And, and you know, as, as data scientists, we'll often, you know, rely on acronyms that are difficult to understand. So I think this sort of joint, joint working, it's really important. You know, our advisory, our research, 
Super Research Advisory Group of, the people with lived experience working in data mining are amazing. They are working across other organisations now. They've published articles. And I guess one of the things that we're really proud of is we developed a glossary. Um, and that was a glossary across academics and our research advisory group. It's got more than 147 terms in it. And it was really taking language like long read sequencing or linkage of data and giving really simple explanations. And that can form the basis of people feeling confident enough to be having conversations about their data. So that glossary is easily searchable and available on our website and is you know, phenomenally accessed. Now, it seems like a really simple thing to do, but it involved a lot of conversations about, you know, I don't know what you're saying, what's your understanding of this? And um, really led by Nick McLean, our engagement officer. Fair curated data. So we've heard a lot about what fair data is, um, about, you know, very similarly, there are lots of studies held in silos. Mental health data is often siloed from physical health data, and we know how in interlinked they are. So the ways we've gone about making things discoverable is um, one of our partners, Louisa Arsenal, is a co-investigator. She holds a specialist catalogue, which is, you know, shown all the long loads of 55 UK based longitudinal studies, all the mental health measures so that people can find the measures that may answer the questions they have in relation to mental health. Now we created an, uh, an API. So basically this specialist catalog is completely um, interlinked now with the gateway. That's one of the things that we've done. So that is open to everyone to look at and search for. But we've, we're also doing very similar work to alleviate in terms of annotating and creating easy ways to process mental health data in other studies. You know, so there's a need both for work across the physical mental health divide and then also work that's, that requires much more specialist catalogues. And, and uh, we were awarded a transparency project. So we're gonna be working with summaries of the studies in the catalog of mental health measures um, to identify new glossary terms that will enable those conversations to happen, happen about cohort data. So this is like a representation of the raft of studies with, uh, you know, not all of them by far are focused on mental health data, but we have you know, created the metadata, annotated that data, so it's much easier to do that research, led by Louise. Other things that we've been doing is we've um, identified, this was led by David Osborne and Naomi Launders, identified uh, participants in general population cohorts with a diagnosis such as schizophrenia. So in each cohort, there may be like 20 people but you pull all those 20 people together in each cohort and you've got a, like a super cohort that you can really answer some complex questions on. And we're doing that. Um, another partner is the UK Longitudinal Linkage Collaboration. So those tables are available for anyone to use. So you can find a mental health problem and see where you can find people with it. Now, in order to to answer questions, do research on those cohorts, you want, to, you want to know that the questions being asked are similar, you know, that they're, they're similar concepts. And that's where our data harmonization and work with Harmony comes into play. So there's, there's lots of things going on. Now, as everyone knows, when you're working with um, routinely collected data, when you look, in order to identify people, you need code lists. Now, for GP data, that's read codes. For um, hospital data, that could be uh, 
ICD-10 ICD codes or SNOMED codes. We have created those lists. What we tend to do is we pull lists together across uh, papers. We work with clinicians. You would be amazed at how different those code lists are. And the ones that we have externally validated, um, so look to see that they're measuring what they say they measure, are all housed in the data mined collection, which is findable in the phenotype library. Part of, um, you know, so there's all the work that we do to make data analyzable across different jurisdictions and interlinkable, but it also needs to be made visible to people that they know it's there. So one of the pieces of work that we've done is, is creating dashboards. And we worked with the school's research network in Wales, but the work has been spread across England and Scotland. Uh, so Joe Inchley and Simon Murphy work with us on this to create a data dashboard. I talked about the, the reasons why workforce capacity and training is developed is really important in this area. We work with MQ, there are video courses, conferences and workshops. We lead a mental health data science meeting twice a year with MQ. Um, these are the, the topics we cover. Um, and we do a workshop, particularly for ECRs, in the day before the conference. And that's open to everyone. I think it's about £15 to apply. And we've had amazing feedback on those courses. Um, and I guess it's just showing that, that realising there are lots of people who have the skills to be working with this sort of data, but they wouldn't know where to find it or how to amalgamate it. And I guess this is where creating these workshops, meetings, capacity and networks is really important. And I think this is my last slide. So going forward, we took a very federated approach to trusted research environments, but in line with um, the Goldacre report, um, we will be supporting the, the UKRI funded mental health platform hubs and housing their data. We're also, as part of the trials work that we did um, with physical health trials, we have a common mental health data set and that data will be stored in the data mined trusted research environment and made visible and um, accessible for people to um, access. Now, I guess the curation services that we offer, and it's powered by, by SERP, um, led by Simon Thompson, means that, you know, there's the data that you collect as part of the study, you do your part, but then there's, you know, there's more and more owners, both from funders, researchers and government, that that data is available for secondary analysis. Now, it's very difficult for all of us when a study's over to manage those applications. And that's something that, that we see as one of our core jobs. So similarly, we've got a website, social media presence. We would love to hear from you. Thank you so much, Anne, for that lovely introduction and explanation of, of the, the wonderful Data Mind Hub. Um, we actually now have some time for some Q&A, so I'll just share my screen. Um, there we go. Okay, kind of hopefully you can see that. So we have a Q&A session, and, and we've had a few of these that have that have come up um, via the, the Q&A. And thank you for those that have already been answered. Uh, just to take the first one, Abby, yes, um, the, uh, the, 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 the webinar is being recorded and it will be shared. So please don't worry about missing any of this webinar. It will be made available to you. Um, uh, there's been some comments about, thanks, this is an interesting presentation, useful, useful information. Um, this is a brilliant session from Anne John. I, I know that I, I know this this is about data, but her focus um, was on the public and the difference it can make. So well done. Um, there was another one actually. Thank you, Gordon, for re replying from 
um, alleviate, but it, there is one from, from Anthony Cope saying for both alleviate and data mind, how do you standardize qualitative data, um, i.e. descriptions and sense of, um, for pain and mental health issues that are difficult to quantify at times? And I wonder, Anne, if, if you had, um, can you, first of all, can you see the questions in the answered section? Um, and I wondered if you, you wouldn't mind answering that if, if you can. So um, by qualitative data, I'm gonna first talk about the, the things that practitioners and patients discuss and the routinely collected data. So absolutely, that's vitally important to mental health and I would assume to pain as well. And lots of things are, are captured in, in the recording of codes. So one of the big work streams, one of our road builders led by Rob Stewart, is natural language processing. And so um, what they've done is they've developed lots of, uh, I'll call them algorithms, to capture that free text, that qualitative data, so that we can identify not just the, con the conditions and that people have, but also the symptoms that they have, and also the outcomes as a result of any treatments and managements that happen. Um, um, so Rob has worked tirelessly for years with colleagues in, in Kings to create these algorithms. And I think what the great thing about, you know, the data mind remit is, is that, that we're under discussions with the gateway about how that's made it visible and available to all. So those algorithms will be available to everyone so that we're not just working with coded data, we're standardizing that qualitative data. Thank you very much. Um, we also have another question for you, Anne, um, from Laura Ward saying, love the idea of, of super cohorts for, for greater statistical power for smaller groups. Do you work with clinicians and psychiatrists for greater visibility of less prevalent health conditions? For example, intellectual disabilities. So um, absolutely, and but I guess so. This is a really interesting one for me. So I so I absolutely see the importance of intellectual disabilities, substance misuse, um, you know, all the really important factors that pay that touch on mental health, and also physical health conditions. And I guess you know, watch this space. At the moment, you know, we bid up, we bid off a huge chunk of work to do, and we we've definitely made huge progress in the physical mental health domain, which is often overlooked. But I think as as time goes on, you know, really doing these things in terms of intellectual uh, difficulties and disabilities and uh, substance use is is the way forward. So absolutely, and. You know, in in many ways, you know, so so the team in Data Mind covers psychiatrists, psychologists, social scientists. You know, I come from a primary care clinical background and public health. So yes, absolutely. Thank you very much. And um, I have a, a couple of questions actually for for the whole panel. Um, what do you see as the biggest challenge in the health data research right now? Shall I say that one? Yes, thank you. Um, so there's two th two things I'd say. One one is um, technical, and one is uh, I guess process. The the biggest challenge, which is both it's there for the right reason, is is governance. So is actually getting access to the data in the first place. Quite rightly, there are controls in place for for getting access to data for doing your research. And you have to fulfill uh, several requirements for being able to access data, one of them being that it has to be in the public benefit um, and that you'll you'll use the data for the right purposes and things like that. Absolutely, we should answer those questions and we should make sure that we use the data correctly. Um, but it takes way, way, way too long. It can take many, many months before you get anywhere near access to the data. 
um, where for no good reason really it's just you're just waiting for people to meet to make a decision and then they make it and then feedback and you have to wait another so it's really inefficient and and so those sorts of things have to be improved the other one um and actually kind of is kind of what um uh was mentioned by david at the beginning is that actually getting access to the data is, is very difficult because you don't know where it is and it isn't sitting in a giant big bucket in 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 your local city or wherever. It's all over the place. Even even the routine hospital data. So you know, trying to bring that data not together, but making it more available, um, like like the, the, these data hubs are doing, um, is is a really big step, and it's really difficult to do. And I think there's still a long way to go before. It, things are very smooth for, for making research go much faster, much quicker, and so that we can we can help people you know, with, their, with their health conditions. I guess, so I would strongly agree with those two points, and I'd add capacity. You know, we, we really need more people working in the field to realise all the potential of the innovations that are happening. And that involves, you know, what in the NHS we call workforce planning, which, you know, it really starts at the, it really starts in schools, schools and courses. At, uh, Alison, I'd, I'd just, I suppose, probably echo, but, but, but focus particularly on one of the real sort of, if you want, foundational data assets around primary care. Uh, and I think particularly when we look at mental health uh, or data mind and alleviate, uh, two conditions, you know, pain and mental health, predominantly managed in the community or not in acute hospitals, and therefore actually uh, across all disease areas and conditions, primary care data is absolutely essential. But I think in these areas in particular, uh, it's even more important. Um, and therefore that challenge of thousands of, of effectively data controllers uh, sitting within GP practices and the sort of appropriate governance around that, but making that happen uh, at scale, I would say, is the number one challenge currently. Thank you very much. I hope there's um, a, one minute for one more question I have from a part participant for, for you again, Anne. Um, interested in the panel's thoughts um, on challenges and considerations around collecting and managing different types of data between mental health population groups categorised by age, for example, older age psychiatry, children and adolescent mental health services, CAMS, and adult mental health services. So a lot of the data that we work with covers the whole population across their ages. And I think what you've highlighted is the fact that, you know, in mental health, but actually across the board health wise, lots of things develop in an early age or are determined by early life circumstances and may manifest across the life course. And, you know, the data that we work with allows you to follow people up across their life course and um, you know that can that can demonstrate you know the the treatments and interventions that work but also the sometimes the best time to deliver them you know we know that lots of mental health problems start manifesting very early on we did a study where you know we were looking at people in school but we looked at people who've been diagnosed with uh, schizophrenia or bipolar disorder up to the age of 24 and you could see things manifesting early on so so actually the innovations that have happened in data have enabled us to make those connections across the life course much more easily thank you very much and thank you everybody for a wonderful webinar this afternoon i do believe that we are now um, past three o'clock. So just to say thank you so much for attending and to all the speakers and all the effort that's been put in. Thank you very much. And we'll see you again soon. Thank you.